If you have your Bibles today, uh, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 10. First Kings 10. I'm going to jump right in today. I've been charged to open up a new series here at Calvary on generosity. I got one woo and she's in covenant. She has to say it. Ushers lock the doors. Nobody can leave. Yes, we're preaching on generosity. Lock the doors up. You cannot leave until after I'm done. But I've been charged to start this new series on generosity, and I feel the favor of the Lord in this room on it. I feel an encounter with God that is supernatural and special to the likes of which we've never seen is going to take place today. I know this because as I was praying and believing God uh, for what he would desire to be said to his people today, specifically on this topic, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, how can I teach this in a way that pleases you? Because this is about generosity, there's finances involved, there's money involved, there's stewardship involved. And Lord, I know that your word says that one day those that teach the gospel will be double judged when we go through heaven. You get to go through the line one time, I got to go through it two times. And so I'm like, Lord, I want to make sure that I steward this moment properly in a way that pleases you. Because I didn't come here to entertain people, I came here to please you. And the Lord moved me from behind my desk and I laid in the floor in my office and I began to weep. And the Lord said to me, don't teach them how to give. And I said, well, Lord, what am I supposed to do? He said, teach them how to encounter me with their giving. Because what I long is them. I own a cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need their money. I long for intimacy and I long for fellowship with them. And so today I didn't come here to preach as a guest preacher. I came here to minister to you as a son. As a son who has reaped a harvest from your previous generosity. As a son that represents five Florida campuses that have used the generosity of Calvary Christian Center in Ormond Beach, Florida to take territory. I come to you today as a son. I came here at 21 years old and I'm now, this is what Apostle does when he tells his age, right? I'm 40. When he said, when he tells everybody he's 70. (laughs) 18, 19 years ago, I strolled onto this campus knowing nothing and became a son of this house and you loved me, Calvary. And you sold in 2012 so that my wife and I could step out and go get into a living room in Windermere, Florida and believe God to reach people. And we never left this place looking to build some big church, but we did leave this place knowing that we were going to be a spirit-filled, multicultural, multi-generational church, whatever it looked like. And 12 years later, look what the Lord has done. So I come back home today as a son to tell you that your generosity has made a difference beyond what you can see. Praise the Lord. I believe that one of the greatest demonic deceptions about generosity is to convince God's people that generosity is a money issue and not a spiritual issue. This deception fuels a culture of manipulation and greed while opposing the purity of a kingdom culture. And I'm asking you to clear out everything you've known about generosity. Everything you've known. And let us open our hearts together to hear what the king of the kingdom says about generosity. Don't you want to hear what the king has to say? So let's start here. I'm going to get into this scripture, but the very basics of the kingdom. When Jesus came, it was prophesied that when he would come into the earth through the logos, through the womb of a virgin, he came in flesh form. It was prophesied that Jesus was not going to come and on his shoulders was he going to be carrying fancy building, big name preachers. It wasn't going to be great facilities on his shoulders. It wasn't going to be orthodox or uh, organized religion that would be on his shoulders. It wasn't denominationalism that he was going to be. Jesus didn't come to start Baptist. Jesus didn't come to start Pentecostal. Jesus didn't come to start Kojic or Lutheran, but he came 
with one assignment and that was government was going to be the burden that was on his shoulders. He was carrying the government from another world into this earth and he established it by preaching one message, not the gospel of Jesus, but the gospel of the kingdom. And everywhere that Jesus went, he said, I came to do what my father sent me here to do. I came to establish kingdom. So kingdom is not a religion. It's a government. It's not a religion, it's a government. And I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. That means that I am a citizen of another nation. I'm going to preach a whole different sermon. I, I got to get back on my notes. But I belong to a different nation, and I am underneath a different set of government and legislations that is bound together with keys and principles. So that must mean then, You know, if you read this thing, it'll talk to you. Thank you. It'll talk to you. If you read it, it'll talk to you. This is the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. If Jesus came to establish government, and kingdom is not a religion, it is a gover God's government, then that must mean that this book right here is not a religious book. It's a covenant and a constitution that's full of keys that reveal the benefits that belong to citizens of a government. That's why I read this right here. So I know what my king says I can do. So I know what my king says I can have. Now that you got that, it's important to get this. When kids of the king activate the king's culture with keys or biblical principles, every culture that opposes it fails. I know what's coming in November, but don't you get all worried about it because if you will just institute the keys of the kingdom, every culture that opposes it fails. And today I want to give you one of those keys. One of those keys that will destroy the kingdom of darkness. First Kings chapter 10. If you want to cross-reference this and you'd like to go study after the preacher preaches, which I uh, highly suggest that you do to make sure that the preachers are preaching the gospel right, you should go study this through the week. But you can cross-reference it in Matthew 12, 42. It also mentions it there. 1 Kings 10. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to do what? To test him. Somebody shout Test. Grab that, put it in your pocket. We're going to come back to it later. Test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue. Royal presence protocols, what this was. She came with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was in her mind. Solomon answered all of her questions. And there was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. Sounds like all the husbands in the room, right? Husbands, I gave you a chance to clap. But you're way too scared of that woman you're sitting next to. And I don't blame you. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, or clothing his cupbearers, his burnt offerings that he offered to the house of the Lord, underline this in your Bible, there was no more breath in her. No more breath. I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, half was not even told to me. I heard how great you were, but when I encountered you for myself, I realized I didn't even know half of it. Verse 10, then she, what did she do? Verse 10, what did she do? She gave. So she's royalty. She comes before royalty and she brings forth a gift. 120 talents of gold, a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. And verse 13, and then King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all that she desired. What was the first thing I told you to put in your pocket? Test. 
Now verse 13, let's read it again. And then King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all that she desired, whatever she asked beside what was given to her by the bounty of King Solomon. So she turned and went back to her own land with her servants. So here's the context of what's happening in 1 Kings chapter 10. You have a royal woman seeking diplomatic revelation on how to rule in her land. She comes before a king. Before she asks anything, she brings gifts and lays these gifts before the king. Those gifts then put a demand on the culture of that king of whose kingdom she was in. Thus that test calls her to get underneath something and leave with an authority that she had never had before in her life. Now she could go back to the place that she ruled and she could rule it with greater wisdom and greater authority and it began with her coming before a king bearing great gifts. Today I'm going to preach to you a message entitled The Glory of Generosity and the Lord's going to give us a revelation to why we approach the king with giving. Heavenly Father, you know what? Slip up those hands toward heaven if you want to get under this anointing. Lord, help us steward this moment well. Holy Spirit, open our hearts. Give us hearts of flesh. Remove the heart of stone. I'm asking you, Lord, that every spirit in this room that is not the Holy Spirit to cast it out now. We chase you out of this building now. I know you've heard crazy stuff. I know preachers have done it wrong when they've preached it before. But I'm asking you right now not to allow somebody's misrepresentation of God keep you from representing God. Just because they missed it, just because they messed up, it is not an excuse to get us off the hook from honoring him. So Lord, I pray that you would come in our hearts and purify us every impure thing that we've heard about generosity, every false ideology, all the heresy, uproot those seeds out of our life today. Lord, teach us your ways that we may know you and that we may find your favor. For it is there that we realize that what we were really after is your glory. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and somebody said amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, before you're seated, slap two or three people right upside the back of the head and tell them Jesus loves them. Somebody said, man, are y'all that... Angry and mean at kingdom culture? Yes. If at least once a month we don't hit you upside the back of the head, we don't love you. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Are you ready to learn today? You know, I believe that one word that creates the most chaos, dysfunction, and discomfort in the church is the word money. Money, you can feel it right there. What does apostle say? Draw right up. You can feel it in the room that when you say money, that instantly there's, there's this chaos, there's this dysfunction, there's a discomfort. And I believe the two reasons why are manipulating greedy preachers. I'm talking to the church in America and manipulating and greedy people. But what if I told you there was a kingdom culture way to understand finances and generosity that destroys both manipulation and greed? Would you want to hear about it? Would you want to participate in it? All right, then number one, you need to first recognize that giving is a spiritual matter. It is a spiritual issue. There are two common misconceptions about generosity. One of them is that generosity is all about money. Eh, wrong. The other one is that I can be generous and not give money. Eh, wrong. Because Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 that nobody can serve two masters, for he will hate one. I'm going to read you a lot of scripture today because I would rather you see it in the Bible than hear it from Jeremy. Okay? For either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or your translation may say mammon. This same spirit of mammon is what brings down Babylon in Revelation 18 because the leaders of the world fell in love with the riches and the luxuries of the king, and this spirit of mammon creates the fall of Babylon. Now, 1 Timothy verse 6, the Bible tells us that the love of money now we understand why Jesus said you can't serve it because the love of money is the what? Not having money. 
Having money is not an issue. It's when money has you. That is the issue. The love of money is the root of all evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. If Jesus said the love of money is so bad that you cannot love it and him at the same time, then generosity is not a money issue. Generosity is a spiritual issue. And if Jesus said that the love of money is so great that it keeps you from giving me affection and love and it keeps you from worshiping me, then that tells me, Anderson, that not only is it a spiritual issue, but it's one we must go to war over because generosity creates warfare in the heavenlies. Every time we begin to talk and pull down strongholds on the love of money, the enemy comes in and he tries to bring manipulation. He tries to bring greed and he creates warfare to keep us from encountering God. Because it's not about giving money, it's about encountering God with our giving. Big difference. Can I get ahead of myself? It's not about giving up, it's about getting under. All right? And if I'm being honest with you, every time I minister on this topic, I undergo extreme warfare. If I can be really transparent with you, I couldn't sleep last night, all night. The first time I preached this in our church, I could not sleep that night, all night long. I could feel the weight of ministering on this because I know that it has been misconstrued in the Western church today. I know that people have seen it abused. I know that people have seen it done wrong. I know people have turned on their TV and seen people begging for money and asking for money for all the wrong reasons and the enemy has convinced us that receiving tithe and offering in church is, in, is to meet a church budget, but that is not what it's supposed to be about. When we come into the house of God, we are coming before a king and when we bring forth an offering. It is not so the local church can meet a budget. It's personal between me and God because I love him so much and I want to value who he is in my life. But every time I minister on this, I feel the, 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 the anxiousness and that, that Jezebelic spirit come in and your heart starts pounding and it starts to beat and your palms get sweaty and you have to take authority over it. I can feel when I'm ministering in a room when there are moments when the enemy is working on individuals. Now, good news is I don't know which one of you it is. Because <laughs> if I did, I'd come right down and preach next to you. If I ever come preach next to you and I put my hand on your shoulder, that means I'm fighting a devil off of your life. <laughs> Somebody said, thank God I'm sitting in the middle. <laughs> so has generosity been manipulated in the church? Yes, it has. And I apologize on behalf of all preachers that has stood in God's holy pulpit, I apologize. And I ask for your forgiveness on behalf of all preachers that have stood up here and used sermons on generosity to get a dollar bill out of your pocket and refuse to teach you that generosity is about encountering God from an intimate posture and loving him so much that you desire to release these things. But mammon has told you that you better hold back. You know, the economy's doing this and crypto's not looking good and there's an election change here and you shouldn't do this and it's trying to bind you up by the government of the world instead of letting you use the keys that's from a government that's of a different world. There are six common statements that you hear about money in the church. Every one of them's backed by a spirit. We're gonna expose these spirits. Every one of them. I don't have to give. I don't have to give. Tithing is not in the New Testament. Or oh, you wait till next week. We got one for you. Come on back. I don't have to give. That's a spirit of greed. I have to give. Spirit of legalism. I can't give. Spirit of poverty. I give to get. Spirit of manipulation. You've heard that in churches and conferences all over the nation. It's like going to a dadgum auction. Hey, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Now you give five, God will give you 10. Now you give 50, God will give you 100. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? But then we transition. Those are all spirit of mammon. But then I get to give is a spirit, the spirit of freedom. But then you mature 
from even I get to give in the spirit of freedom to I give because I'm a steward and that is a spirit, the spirit of wisdom. So right now I speak to these spirits of mammon, greed, legalism, poverty, and manipulation. And I command you by the power and authority of Christ Jesus to loose the people in this room and let them go. If there's any spirit of mammon that has been through the bloodline of your family that has caused you to be disconnected from God. I command you spirits to leave this room now. You are not welcome. The blood of Jesus is the highest authority in the earth today. I plead the blood over every person in Calvary Christian Center right now. I plead the blood over everybody watching online. If poverty has been in your family, be gone in Jesus' name. And I release the spirit of freedom and the spirit of wisdom. Now this, this, let's back on the kingdom. Somebody said, what happened to 1 Kings 10? We'll get back there in a minute. Y'all are getting me really excited. The overarching principle of giving in the kingdom is this. You own nothing, you steward everything. You own nothing. You steward everything. You have to get this. Or you, listen to me, beloved, hear me. You will be angry. Every time we talk about tithe, offering, or money in the church, you will get upset, get uncomfortable, and you know how you do. We know you. You take them long bathroom breaks right at tithe and offering. So if you catch somebody in the bathroom during tithe and offering, rebuke them on the spot. Right up in the bathroom. But if we don't, if we don't understand this, then we will forever be offended about resources and the kingdom of God that we own nothing and we steward everything. There is an awful statement that I've heard in church a, a million times that is, that is used to try to guilt people into giving so that churches can meet budgets. Again, I'm not talking about Calvary. I have a message for the church of Jesus Christ in America. And it's this, it's time for our tithe and offering. Give your tithe, tithing is 10%. Your 10%, that 10% belongs to the Lord. You ever heard that? Your 10% belongs to the Lord. Has anybody ever heard that in church? Do you agree with that? Yeah, you're wrong. That only makes sense in a Western democratic ideology. That I give what is mine in order for God to steward it. In a kingdom, all things belong to to the king. So my 10% is not his. 100% of everything that I have belongs to King Jesus. I am here on an official assignment from heaven. See, baby, you existed in God before the foundation of the world was ever set. You were already in God, and God allowed you to be born when you were born with an assignment on your life to advance the culture of his kingdom in the earth. That is the reason that you are here today, and everything he gave you was what? was to resource you to fulfill the assignment that was on your life. Listen, the Lord ain't got no problem with you using some money and going to Disney, and, and please don't go to Disney. I don't, I don't even like it. The lines are too long, but going out to eat, getting get the house and the car and all of that, as long as you realize that the first purpose of your resources is to advance the kingdom of God. That is number one. God gave it to you to resource you in your assignment. My wife is not mine. My children are not mine. My bank account, yes, my name is on a bank account of Bank of America, but before it was ever there, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It was him that released, for your Bible says that it is the Lord that gives man the power to gain wealth. It wasn't you. I know you went to school. I know you got a degree, but did you put breath in your lungs in the morning? If you can't put breath, oh God, somebody help me preach. If you can't put breath, in your own lungs, then hush your mouth about what you own. It is not yours. The clothes on your back's not yours. You were pulled from the dust. You're going to go back to the dust. You can't take any of this with you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I like this. But 
because you have yet to understand generosity through the lens of love. That's it. Not religion. Not a bucket passing in front of you in a church service. We've reduced and minimized the power and the authority of generosity. So thus we get upset about it. You don't know how hard I work for this. I work two jobs in order to make ends meet. Man, you're preaching to me about generosity. Yeah, well, if you got two mites, it'll work as long as you're honoring the Lord. It ain't an amount issue. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And until you understand generosity through the lens of love, you're forever going to push back on sermons like this. You will forever resist it, thus you will leave this church the same way that you came in because you've put up a wall and a hedge in order to protect yourself against the revelation of Christ Jesus. That is not a spirit from the Lord. It is a tormenting spirit that is building a protection around you, keeping you from receiving what God wants in your life. Now somebody give the Lord praise. So I steward what belongs to him because generosity for me is proof of lordship. Lordship, not just savior, but lordship. He's my lord and savior. Lordship means to give up control and become fully submitted to God's will, to God's word and to God's ways. I'll give you some examples. Holy people have given their soul to lordship. Anybody in here giving your soul to lordship? Five of you. Okay. That's okay. We got an altar call at the end. We'll fix all that. Jeez, I was going over here in Norman Beach. <laughs> Joyful people have given their strength and their self-sufficiency over to lordship. Peaceful people have given their mind over to lordship. These last two the church don't like to discuss. I'll just brush by this next one real quick. But healthy people have given their body over to lordship. Thank you for that clap. Generous people have given their finances to lordship. So people don't have a giving problem. They have a lordship problem. They have a problem with rebellion. They have a problem with submission. People generously should fully submit themselves therefore unto God. And those that submit themselves under God, they understand that giving for them, number two, communicates in the kingdom. That's why they are submitted to lordship. Because when they give, they get to do it from a place on I get to come before Abba Father and tell him that I love him. I cannot wait to come and give because in the kingdom, giving communicates affection for the king that's receiving the gift. Oh, I'm getting way ahead of myself. If somebody would help me preach, we might lose this place today. But giving communicates in the kingdom. It communicates. Here's what I love about giving in the kingdom. I love this. The Lord gave me this revelation years ago, and I love this revelation. It gives us a proper perspective of what it is that God's doing in the earth. How many of you got kids in elementary school? Raise your hands high. How many of you had kids in elementary school? Raise your hands. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. How many of you got grandkids in elementary school? Come on, seasoned saints. Bless the Lord. Uh, I don't know if they do this anymore. They, they do it with my children. I don't know if they continue to do this. But when we were in elementary school, we used to have this thing called Santa Claus Workshop. Anybody ever heard of that? Santa's Workshop. Santa's Workshop, the kids will go into the library, and the library will be decked out like the North Pole. Candy canes and elves everywhere and presents. And they have all of these wonderful, nice designer gifts laid out for the children to go in there and purchase a gift for mommy and daddy. Your kids ever done this? I remember many years ago when my 13-year-old, who's a teenager now, I remember when he was younger, um, and he was actually born while we were still here. 
I remember that he went to Santa's workshop, Santa Claus workshop. And they wrap it up for you there too. They wrap the gift up. And so that gift is sitting under the tree for the whole month. And I mean, it's every day. It's not even Christmas morning yet. Daddy, when you going to open the gift? Daddy, when you going to open the gift? Daddy, daddy, when you going to open the gift? They, they are so excited because when they walked into that library, it looked like North Pole. But it wasn't North Pole that attracted them. It was the opportunity to get something to tell their daddy they loved him. Watch, watch, watch. And so what excited them is they could not wait for the interaction to see how their father felt when the gift was open and received from their father. So it's every day, Daddy, when you open my gift, Daddy, when you open my gift, Daddy, when you open my gift. And you, and you know these gifts are real nice. They, uh, my son got me this wonderful, I've been w- waiting for it my whole life. It was this I Love Dad NFL glass paper mache coffee mug. And the coffee's so hot you can't even drink out of the coffee mug. And, and then for mama, they love getting mama. They got like knockoff Gucci, Gucci stuff and Dolce and bananas and all kind of name brand, diamond earrings, like Tiffany and company and all this. I mean, they're, they're, and they are so excited, right? They come home and they're so excited and they're waiting for this opportunity to give this gift in order for them to communicate their love for me. And then here it is on Christmas morning. They come walking in on Christmas morning. Daddy, open this one first. Open this one first. I can't wait for you to open this one first. I can't wait. And so we get the gift and we open it up and I'm like, oh, yes. Just what I wanted. Keep in mind, I could have gone and bought it myself. Just what I wanted. Just what I wanted. And then my son takes off running across the living room and jumps in the air into my arms. The cup falls, it's a true story, the cup falls on the couch because the reality was it wasn't the cup that I wanted. It was the moment of intimacy that I was having with my son. I could care less about the NFL coffee mug. I just wanted that moment of intimacy. His gift was telling his daddy how much he loved me, and I couldn't wait to open it, not so that I could get the gift. I didn't really need the coffee mug, but I wanted to embrace my son in a moment of generosity and let him know, baby, I see you. I heard you communicating. I heard your love for me. Give your father a hug. I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh, and that's what it's like when we give in the kingdom. When you understand it through a lens of love, you come in before the house of God cheerful and wonderfully excited because you can't wait to tell your daddy how much you love him. Oh, praise God. Here's where it gets even better. I said, here's where it gets even better. See, what I forgot to tell you was two weeks prior to that moment of intimacy, where you think they got the money where you think they got the money to get the gift so that we could have a moment of intimacy together. They don't work a nine to five down at the McDonald's. Baby, that daddy gave them that money and they went to Santa's North Pole and they stewarded that money to get a gift to tell me they love me. And when they did it, I realized that everything I gave to them was worth it. How you think I would have felt if I gave them that money and they bought themselves some Doritos in the vending machine? How you think I would have felt if I didn't get that moment of intimacy with them? It wasn't about the gift. It was about them taking what I gave them and stewarding it in order to show me that they love me. Because every good and perfect gift, the Bible says, comes from the Father. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him. And He loves a cheerful giver. Now, it comes to the question, did I use the coffee mug? For six weeks, every morning, babe, testify, wave your hand so they know I'm not making an evangelist up. For six weeks, Jaden would come in the living room, Daddy, when are you going to use my mug? Daddy, when are you going to use my mug? Well, baby, I can't even hold coffee in this mug. It is so hot. Daddy, when you gonna use my mug? Daddy, when you gonna use my mug? True story. Daddy, when you gonna use my mug? Finally, one morning, I'm sitting out in my morning devotional, and he's a kid. Oh man, I miss him. I miss him being little. 
he comes running through the door in the living room. He sees me <laughs> sipping out of his mug. He literally jumps out of his shoes. Daddy, you're using my coffee mug. And you're using my coffee mug. I mean, he's smiling ear to ear. He has so much joy when I am using when I'm using the gift that he brought. See, that's how you should act every time somebody gets saved in this house. Every time somebody comes, oh, daddy's using the gift. Daddy's using the gift. Every time you see the outreach truck roll out of this parking lot, you ought to say, daddy's using my gift. Every time we feed people in need, you ought to jump up and down and say, oh, bless God, he's drinking out of the coffee mug. When you hear me celebrate as a son about the people getting saved in Orlando, people getting healed, people getting transformed, you ought to jump up and down that daddy, use your gift. Give God praise. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Somebody shout, daddy, use my gift. Use my gift. Praise the Lord. So giving's not a forced behavior. Baby, it's a response of love. That's the encounter God's looking for. That's the encounter. Because when you pass through this, you recognize this. Proverbs 18, the Bible says this, watch. A gift opens doors for the one that gives it and brings him before the presence of great people. Let's get back on the text, and I, I'm, I'm really about to close. You know what that means? No, it does with me. It means something. <laughs> I love you, apostle. I love you. Uh, the, the queen of Sheba refused to come empty-handed. Study geographically. Study what she brought. Catch this. She travels 1,500 miles with $250 million. I don't even know how you traveled with all that. $250 million, why? Royal protocol. And when you study royal protocols, you learn that you must not come before a king without a gift. Matter of fact, in a kingdom, you give before you speak. You're not allowed to speak until you give. This is why... In your Bible, when God instructed Moses and the children of Israel on how to steward the festivals and the feast, he said, oh, and by the way, don't come before me empty-handed. It's in your Bible. If you read the Bible, it'll talk to you. Deuteronomy 16 and 16. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So the gift is used to communicate to the king how you feel about them, how you esteem them, how you perceive them. Giving exposes the heart more than words. In the kingdom, I don't have to give. I don't give to get. I give because I esteem the king too much to break a presence protocol. You hear me? We're in a kingdom. So in the kingdom, giving is the way I communicate to the king my value to him. This is why King David said in 2 Samuel 24 that I will not give of the Lord that which costs me nothing because I esteem the king too much to bring him less than what he deserves. It's a love interaction. I want God to know that I value him, that I esteem him, that I am grateful for him, that I see him, that I love him, that I want relationship with him. That's why I gave him my life because he's the king of my salvation. I esteemed him as the king of my salvation. How many of you remember when you gave your life to Jesus? You gave your life in an act of generosity. He gave you life, but you took the life. You gave it back to him because you were communicating the love of salvation, that he's the king of your salvation. You give him your time because you're telling him that he is the king of eternity. I value you eternally. I give him my sickness because I esteem him as the king of my healing. I give him my money because I value him as the king of my provision. I don't give for a man. I don't give from a place of pressure. Baby, you ain't going to pressure me into giving. I will never give from a place of pressure. I already gave before you applied the pressure because love applies something to me that your pressure cannot provide. I give because I'm in the presence of my king. Baby, when you hold back your generosity, you're not hurting a church organization. You're hurting your intimacy with the king by breaking presence protocols. 
So when you do these things, and I am on my last point now, you come before the king, and number three, giving tests the king. It tests the king. It tests the king. Now, I know some seasoned OG saints in here said, yeah, I know Malachi. I know it tests the Lord. It tests the Lord. But before we get there, let's just kind of work through the Bible in order to get to Malachi so you have a proper understanding. Revelation chapter 1. The Bible says that we are lowercase kings on the earth. Okay, we are kings. Kings and priests. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the lowercase kings of the earth. And he made us kings and priests to his God and Father. The queen of Sheba was royalty, visiting the greatest king on the earth, and she gave. So even kings bring gifts to kings because it is a known culture in the kingdom to give. Now watch. When you come before God, you are a lowercase king. You are royalty, made royalty by the blood of Christ Jesus, coming before the king of kings, and you are bringing a gift because, watch, this is not democracy, this is kingdom. You are honoring the presence of a king that you perceive as greater than who you are. See, the problem with us giving is we like to capitalize our K and become a capital K king, and we want to rule right in God right here, and we want to rule right here. The truth truth is, yes, you rule and reign with him, but make no mistake about it, baby. You are underneath him on the hierarchy chart. You are underneath the king of kings and lord of lords. You aren't capital K. You are lowercase K, which means you've given up the right to make your own decisions. You've given up the right to have your own opinion. You've given up the right to have your own feelings. You've given up the right to clinch everything you own like you earned it. Thank you, Jesus. Use my gift. So giving in the kingdom, she comes before him and she gives. And inside of a kingdom, a king's wealth, a king's glory, let me say it like this, a king's glory is always measured by his wealth. The land that he has, the people that he has, the treasures that he has. So when a king receives a gift from another king, what do you think the receiving king does? If giving measures the glory, or excuse me, wealth measures the glory, then the receiving king always gives back because giving in a kingdom places a demand on the receiving king's glory. Because now he's being tested. And he says, Solomon said to Sheba, I got to give a gift to show everybody here that your glory is not greater than my glory. Your giving will never go without a response from the king. Don't you miss this. Queen of Sheba brought a gift that put a demand on the glory of Solomon. And verse 13, the Bible said that after Sheba gave, that the king Solomon gave back to the queen of Sheba. Church, let me tell you this morning that the king of kings will never be outgiven. He will prove to you that his glory is greater. There is no dollar bill. There's no vehicle. There's no time. There's no energy. There's no prayer. There is nothing that you can bring to the king that he will leave it undone because there's not a chance that he's going to let your glory be greater than his glory. So every time you give, you are putting a demand on on the heavenlies. You're putting a demand on the king of kings and I don't mean it to be aggressive like you own him or you manipulate. You cannot manipulate God, but you are following a principle that is a key that unlocks an ancient door. Oh, I feel excited in the room today and every time I do it, I'm putting a demand and God says, well, so good. So good. I'm going to prove to you here, your glory is not greater. George, I'm going to prove to you, your glory is not greater. Now, you can understand Malachi. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Well, pastor, I already know what you're saying. It's me, y'all saying. That tithe was grain. That tithe was fruit. I know. Guess what? You're right. We're going to get you next week. We're coming for you. No pressure, Pastor Jim. Well, we're coming for you next week. Well, that was an actual storehouse. That wasn't the church. We're coming for you too next week. But now you understand why in Malachi it says, bring the tithe. What is tithe? How much? Ten. 
And he says, if you do this, he said, test me. Same principle that Sheba used with Solomon. Test me in this, Channing, and then see if I will not. See. Test my glory. See if your tin don't turn into a floodgate. See if your tin don't open up a window. Why? It's the principle of generosity in the kingdom. When you give to the king, he says, test me. The Lord says, test my glory and see if your little 10% is not going to open up a window and I'm going to pour out so much, you don't even have room to receive it. I ain't going to let you get through this season without proving to you, Erica, that my glory is greater than anything you can do. So every time I release something, I'm not giving it up. I'm getting underneath the glory. I'm not giving up money. I'm coming underneath the glory that can save my family, that can heal my mind, that can touch my body, that can save my life, that can turn me around. I'm coming underneath something that's not of this world. Yes. The Bible says this, that when she came under this glory, see, that's the thing. Whenever you get under that king's glory, you leave with wealth that you didn't come in with. And it ain't always money. Matter of fact, you need to get this idea out of your head that money is dollars and cents and think of it as seed and love. It's seed and love. I, when I come underneath the glory of the king, I leave different. I leave changed. So the Bible said that the queen of Sheba, when she left, there was, John, there was no more breath in her. No more breath. Here's what's fascinating. Remember I told you you get underneath what? Glory, right? No more breath in her. The word breath in the Hebrew is ruah, which means the departing at death. It also means the spirit of God manifested as Shekinah glory. That literally... She got out of her own glory and underneath Shekinah glory. This denotes right here in the text that the queen came in one way. She came in with one idea. She came in with one agenda. She came in with one plan and it died and she left with a new life underneath a new glory. The queen of Sheba's generosity towards Solomon did not change his life but you better bet your bottom dollar that it changed her life. She went back to her world with greater wisdom. She went back mama and daddy with greater wisdom on how to rule the the children she went back to her job with a greater peace about what's taking place went back out into this world with a greater discernment about what is happening in the earth today didn't walk around blind anymore she could see things she'd never seen before she could access realms she'd never accessed before and they would say to her where did you get so smart where did you get all this intel where did the wealth of the wicked transfer to your hands where did all of this take place I know your life I know what you've been about about. And you just tell them, look, I went before the king and got underneath something that superseded my ability to earn it. I got underneath it. I got underneath it. So like I said, that generosity then, give me some sweet Jesus music. What time are we supposed to be done? I don't see no clocks. I, I can go all day. We got three services over in um, Winter Garden. So they make me watch the clock because we got parking lot attendants that are half saved and they will cuss me out if I go over sometime. <laughs> That's okay. That's where we put the new converts, right out there in the parking lot. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Well, Pastor, you've been real passionate. You've been sweating and you've been hollering and you've been dancing. And, um, but you're one of those New Testament people. I got you. It's okay. I am too. I like both. I want to see Jesus use this principle. That's what I want to see. You've preached on the Queen of Sheba. you preached on Solomon. You've talked about the testing and the giving and the consequences, getting underneath the glory. But pastor, if I'm going to receive this, I need to see Jesus do it. I would say, okay. That's great. Can I take you to John chapter 4? Jesus walks up to this broken woman at a well. Desperate, hurting. 
She's got 42 and a half husbands, and the one she's shacking up with ain't even her husband. You know the story. Jesus walks up to her. Now keep in mind, Jesus can make bread fall from heaven. Jesus can cause a brook to dry up and a brook to produce water. Jesus can use the staff of a prophet and a pastor to strike a rock and water come from a rock. Ask Moses. Jesus can cause red seas to part. Jesus can walk on water. Jesus has power over water. He is water himself. It is the water of the word, the cleansing of the water of the word. He is. He encompasses everything about water, yet he walks up to a broken desperate woman and says woman give me a drink he said I want to set you up woman give me something bring me what you have bring me a gift he didn't need water Jesus wasn't thirsty he's setting her up and she gets selfish and stingy. And she says, but you ain't got a bucket and you're a Jew and all these excuses. And, 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 yeah. and then Jesus looked at her. Here's, here's the principle. Here's the protocol. I've been preaching it all morning. And Jesus said, woman, you can bring it up. I think I got it. He said, if you only knew the gift that I was about to give to you. He said, your bucket of water would have turned into living water because your bucket would have put a demand on my glory and I would have shown you that my living water is greater than your well water. I'm trying to set you up. Can I tell you that every opportunity you have to give before the Lord, it is a setup. It is not an invitation to get rid of something. It is an invitation to intimacy so that you can trade your well of water for living water so you can get underneath something that you've never, ever, Ever been underneath before and I love the Lord and I fear the Lord too much to not be generous I want you to hear this in purity I don't want to preach to manipulate anything I want you to hear it in purity your giving is not about this house meeting a budget and saying that giving is an extension of worship is not a cliche church term it's true. I just don't think we understand that. I think we have, we have said that to try to soften a blow because we lack the revelation to actually understand what it means to give as an act of worship. When my son on that Christmas morning gave, I don't mean this in a blasphemous way, just hear what I'm saying. It was like an act of worship for him. It was him letting his father know, I love you. And then him standing back and saying, Daddy, will you use it? Can I tell you, Calvary, that the generosity you've brought to your father has been used to turn this city upside down now for the last 27 years. 27 years. Is it right, 27? How long is Apostle Rayleigh and Pastor? 27 years, right? For 27 years and even beyond. But for the last 27 years, do you know that, and he didn't ask me to do this, but I love Apostle Rayleigh, my spiritual father. Do you know that however old he is, he's on up there now. <laughs> he's way on up there. Dresses cooler than me, but he's way on up there. Do you know that he still calls, we still talk every day, if not every other day, chanting to your daddy. And he's just, if not more passionate to reach more people now than he's ever been. And he's talking about other campuses and other sons and other daughters and how, how can we do something in this city together, son. And now we're collaborating together on how to go to cities and reach. And I can't tell you the blessing that it is for my life to get on the phone with him and know we're going to be able to go spread the gospel and take territory because we are a part of a family that esteems a king so much that they will be generous to advance the gospel because preaching the gospel's free but spreading it costs money and God gives us resources doesn't the Bible say that he gives seed to the sower 
So my resource is nothing but seed and the motive of my heart is love. So I'm telling you, never walk in church again and feel pressure to give. I'm talking from the balcony all the way through. Never walk in this house and feel pressure. Oh no, I have to give. Never feel that pressure when the bucket crosses in front of you or people are coming to the front. Where you're like, oh no. Oh no, I, I, I have to do this. I, I don't like this. I need to avoid this moment. I want you to look at every single moment that you're giving as an opportunity to engage in warfare. An opportunity to engage in warfare. Remember I told you that the love of money is the root of all evil? Okay? And we are, ushers, if, if you want to prepare, we'll receive offering at the end of this, but listen to me. The love of money is the root of all evil. Well, the Bible also tells us that God would never allow us to get into a situation that he would not give us a way out of. Right? There's no temptation that he wouldn't give us a way out of. What if generosity is your way out of falling into the trap of the love of money being the root of all evil? Why would he not give us a way out? So every time I am generous and give, I am beating the enemy up and I'm declaring, I won't love money, I'll love him more. I won't love stuff, I will love him more. I won't love these things. I, and listen, I, I, I didn't make a whole lot this week. It wasn't much to give, but I'm going to bring it forward to the Lord. And the Lord is going to honor you because of your obedience and your generosity and your love for him. Not as out of a place of, of some kind of rule and regulation, but simply because you want to value him in your life. With every head bow and eye closed in this room, I want to do two things real quick. And I'm going to cut you loose. If you're in this room and this is at this point in time, I would ask everybody to stand still unless you absolutely have to use the restroom. This is a time where we honor the Lord. I'm going to give people a chance to know Jesus. If you already know Jesus, you should be interceding right now. You should be asking Daddy to use what you've brought in the past. If you're in this room and you'll say, Pastor, I've heard you preach on giving and generosity and money, but I don't know that I've ever even given my life. Can I tell you the most generous thing you can do is give your life back to him. That's the number one. That's where it starts. Because what this house is, we're not after your hand. We're after your heart. We want your heart turned to the Father. If you say, Pastor, you know what? I don't know that I've ever accepted Jesus as my Savior. Or I have fallen so far off the track, I need to come back home. And this message on generosity has stirred me to get my life back right with Jesus. If you'll say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. Will you please pray for me? Will you wave your hand at me on three? One, two, three, just wave your hand. Lift your hand high. If you want to get your life right with Jesus. All over this room. If you've got your hand raised, will you stand up so I can pray with you? I'm not trying to embarrass you, I promise. But will you just stand up so that I can pray with you today? Come on, look at this. All over this room. Don't be ashamed. Stand up. All over this room. You say, Pastor, how in the world do people give their life to Jesus when you preach on generosity? It's a kingdom principle, and it works to turn the hearts of the children back to the heart of the Father. I told you, this is not a money thing, baby. This is a spiritual issue. And when you preach it with purity, people will turn to Jesus. I want to pray with you right where you are today. The prayer team is going to take note of where you are. And if you'll do me a favor, I'm going to ask you to do something bold when this service is over. Because this is far more than a prayer. If you're going to follow Jesus, it's more than me just praying with you right now. I want you to make a conscious effort to take your first step of faith. And I want you to meet our prayer team right here at this altar at the close of today's service. This is between you and the Lord. But if you've got your hand lifted and you're standing, we want to give you a Bible. We want to stand with you in prayer. There's a mighty call of God on your life, young man. I've done look back three or four times because I could. there was something about you. God's not done with you. Matter of fact, he's just getting started. And whatever has tried to rob you, whatever has tried to steal from you, whatever has tried to hold you down, I saw like hands on your shoulders trying to push you down. And the Lord said, I, I've taken every hand off of you. 
and you're about to soar as you follow me, says the Lord. You're going to soar and go to higher places and see fresh, see a fresh anointing pour out over your life. So in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Lift your hands, son. Lift them up high. Lift your hands toward the Lord. I declare deliverance right now. I declare freedom right now in Jesus' name. Every generational thing, every foul thing that has set itself against the call of God on this young man's life, loose him now and let him go. He's yours. Let's pray this prayer. And then when service is dismissed, I want you to meet us at this altar. It's your step of faith. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, come on, pray it with me. Say, Heavenly Father, if you're standing, say, Heavenly Father. I'm going to ask you to do something different. Those in the room, I want you to intercede for them. I want the people standing to pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, you came out of heaven through the womb of a virgin, died on the cross for my sins. Three days later, you rose again. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Lord Jesus, you are my Savior. Help me repent and turn to you. I don't want to just be forgiven. I want to turn towards you. So today, at the end of this service, Lord, please give me the courage to go pray with somebody because I believe that through the blood, I don't ever have to go back again. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen. Come on in the Lord, beautiful. Go ahead and sit down. I won't take as long on this one, but I, I need to obey the Lord. If you are in this room, now this is hard. And in order for you to respond to this, it's going to take a spiritual fortitude. And the enemy is going to try to push you and bully you and intimidate you. But if you're in this room today and you were offended while I was preaching, in any way, shape, or form. If you have felt a restlessness in you toward generosity and the things of God, if every time a preacher preaches on money, you feel that tightness, you say, well, Pastor, I don't know that it's offense, but I just feel uncomfortable, or you feel there's a spirit of greed, legalism, or poverty trying to hold you down in your life, I'm not calling you forward. And if nobody raises their hand, I'm not doing this for me. This is for you to honor the Lord. But if you say, Pastor, I'm standing here today and I want to be free. That's me. That's me and I want to be free. I want the spirit of poverty broken off of my life. I want, I want manipulation and greed. I want this offense broken off of my life. If that's you, on the count of three, I just want you to stand. I know it's bold and I know it's radical. But will you stand at your feet and let me pray with you. One, two, three, stand up all over this room. Stand up. Hallelujah. If I could come out here into this sanctuary and hug every one of you, I see you in the balcony. I see you in every section in this church. If I could come high five you and if I could come hug you, let me do it with the microphone. I, uh, I affirm today your boldness. I encourage you today in the Lord. The fact that you would stand for an altar call like that tells me that there's a hunger on the inside of you to know Jesus. Maybe you are manipulated. Maybe there's a generational curse. Maybe you've heard it done wrong but today the Lord is setting you free and you are no longer going to be bound but you are going to live a generous life and you are going to get underneath a glory like you have never seen before today the Lord said I have met you where you are sitting and I will honor your obedience just to stand for some of you this is the second most important stand you've ever taken outside of your first stand to give your life to Jesus Let's pray. Lift your hands. This is just those of you that are standing. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Heal my view on generosity. Give me your perspective. It's all yours. Change my heart. Please deliver me. Spirit of poverty, leave my life now. Spirit of greed, leave my life now. 
Spirit of legalism, leave my, leave my life now. And spirit of manipulation, leave my life now. I declare, I do not love money. I love my king. And today, I have been set free. And whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And I will no longer be bound by the love of money. Come on, say it. Say, I will no longer be bound. Let's the whole church say it. Say, I will no longer be bound by the love of money. And if there's any area in my life that takes ownership and not stewardship, set me free in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen. Did you get anything out of God's word today? Let's pray. You know what, baby, why don't you come up here and pray over the offering today? I'd love for everybody, this is your home too, and I'd love for everybody to see the daughter of the house. One of the daughters, come on up here, beautiful. Isn't she lovely? Love you. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your tangible presence in this place. Lord, we thank you that you've spoken to us, Lord, that our hearts are open to hear your voice, Lord, to receive your word on generosity. Father, I thank you as we cheerfully give unto you, Lord, that you will pour out your glory upon us, Father, that we will feel your presence as we go, Lord. We will feel your protection, Lord. We thank you for the wisdom that you'll give to your people, Lord. We thank you for the provision that you will provide, Lord. We thank you for the healings that will take place, Lord, as we just enter your presence, Lord, through our generosity. So, Father, I thank you for every heart that is turned towards you this morning, Lord. Every ear that hears your voice, every mind that is focused on you, Father, we thank you for it, Lord, that you will pour out your blessing upon us, Lord, that you will open up the windows of heaven. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to show you how much we love you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to show how much we honor you, Lord. That you are the king, that you are first, that you are head, that you rule over all, that you are the throne of our life, God. You govern our minds and our lives, Father. We thank you, Lord, that we put you first in all things. And Lord, right now we put you first in our generosity and our giving. So bless your people as they give to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Come on, why don't you worship the Lord as you give? Just as you give today, just sit right there and let's worship the Lord together. Thanks for watching the message. I'm sure this spoke to you. Here's what I want you to do. Why don't you subscribe to this YouTube channel? That way, every time there's a new message, you'll get to hear it. Also, many of you have watched this. Some of you watch on a regular basis. Why not take time? And so, you can give at calvaryfl.com. You can give on your phones and you can be a part of helping us take this message around the world, the message of hope, the message of Jesus Christ. Can't wait to see you back here real soon.